So my name is Daniel, Daniel Valero, and today I've been invited to give you a talk about laboratory experiments. This is part of my work, part of my research, doing uh, transport experiments in laboratory. And for today, we have this session now, then you will have time to share about your research in a postal session. And then later, we will go to the lab. This lab is one of the most wonderful labs in Europe, so you will see that there's, there's a lot to look here. And they have been uh, kind enough to set up a flu for us, and you will have time also to, to, to try to experiment in the lab and to collaborate together to ask questions and so on. Okay. So this is a little bit the plan for today, and tomorrow you will have Marcel Liederman, who is the, the fieldwork guy at the end. And we will repeat a little bit the same as today, but for free work. Okay. If you have any questions, you can ask me on the on the spot, but this is being recorded as well, as I told you. So if you ask me a question during the presentation, it comes into the recording. If you wait till the end, we can cut it easily. Okay. In any case, let's let's get started. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, first we will quickly revisit why do we do research about plastics, why we think this is important. Then we will talk about how to set up an experiment in a lab. And then I will use some of my research to give you examples of how these experiments were set up and the type of results that we are getting, right? Why I think this can be useful. And very quickly at the end, we will talk about the limitations and challenges of uh, laboratory work. So not everything is uh, easy, easy. There are many problems. Even when you do things very well, there are always limitations. You cannot always go 100% of reality. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end, and we will close up well, with some conclusions, okay? So why plastics? Uh, all of you, if you are here, have an interest in plastics, right? And uh, why should we do research in plastics? Um, a few years ago, I was visiting a, a fair on the weekend with my partner, and there was a water laboratory, a chemistry laboratory, and they were showing samples like this. And I was not working on plastics yet, but when I saw that, I came back to Delft, which is where I was working, and said, oh, I, we need to do research on plastics. Huh? We really need to do research on plastics. And then people in my institute asked me, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, I have no clue. But it's, it seemed important to me that, well, there was something wrong that we were somehow not looking at very carefully. This was 2019, if I remember well. Well, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do or which was the extent of the problem. That wasn't the trigger for me to, to change my research and to somehow change discipline. Huh? Before I was working on bubbles, in hydraulic structures, multi flows as well. And I tried to start with plastics and this is like doing a PhD in a gap. So yeah, it's quite a If I ask you, what do you have for breakfast today? Which is a question I like asking people. 85% of you can say I had microplastics and 15% of you didn't have breakfast today, right? So whatever you had this morning, I would bet a coffee, you had microplastics, no? Let's just release it a little bit. So if you had a tea, it is very likely that you had microplastics. Not all tea bags, not all brands have uh, microplastics, but you, you can get, well, polyamida, uh, polypropylene, very easily from the plastic bags. And it's not two or three microplastics, it's quite a few more, no? Okay, are they good, are they bad? Well, there's still some question on that. We will see as well in a couple of slides. If you like cooking, um, like I like cooking, uh, I like I like cooking, uh, you need to pay attention of, on, on what you use for cooking. Uh, now, sticky pans, for instance, uh, are made of some material that per se is not so dangerous, but when you scratch it and if it uh, overburns at high temperatures, it can lead to PFAS, and so, which is highly casually in us. But, so we have a lot of these substances around and we don't even realize uh, where are we taking it. Uh, recent research suggests that we are taking about 900 particles per day. Right? It doesn't matter if you drink water from the tap, it doesn't matter if you drink water from a bottle, you are not even safe if you're having a beer, which is completely desperating. <laughs> and, the, and the worst part of probably is that we are breathing it in high quantities anywhere. So it's, it's at this moment, it's everywhere. You can escape from it. When we look at size, well, not the particles, it's interesting, especially if you are engineers, if you have worked in clever problems, for instance, you may see that, well, there's some size similarities with sand and sediment. Huh? But we can also have particles which are much smaller, particles that potentially could trespass the blood-brain barrier, which is a system that protects your brain from 
pollution or attacks. Yeah. We just will see that by size, there are some similarities with asbestos, for instance, which you may know is also not very healthy. Huh? So this presents a new problem, which expands multiple dimensions. And when we have multiple dimensions involved, we also have multi-physics, huh? many, many different physics that can come together and define how our problem is working. Why plastics? Well, if we look at animals, it's obvious that animals are very exposed to plastics. Huh? You may throw or you may have a lot of litter in the river that also degrades, produces micro and nanoplastics. You may have also a primary microplastics from industry coming to the river, and they don't distinguish, and by the size, they can easily uh, be intake. And what we know as well is that there are some sort of curves, uh, some curves called toxicological, toxicological curves, that depending on the intake of this type of elements, well, it can produce different series of impacts. Let's talk about humans. That's the we're getting in a muddy field, huh? but what we know, I prepared a talk like this a couple of years ago, and a couple of years ago, you can imagine that it had many of these references. So that's why I'm highlighting the, the years. But I remember saying, well, we're just discovering what's happening with this. I'm sure that if I have to give a talk in two or five years, you know, this slide is gonna go. Huh? And you can see that by now, in a couple of years, this slide has clearly gone. Huh? We know that we have it in the blood, most of us, or probably all of us, have plastic in the blood. Uh, mm -hmm. We have it in the lungs. We have about one microgram, uh, no, one microplastic per microgram of, of tissue in the lower in the lower side of the, of the lungs, which is not surprising with the amount that we are breathing. Huh? These particles can also pass the tissue. So once inside the body, they can translocate to the places. And we know that this is also in the placenta and that this affects some biological developments in the placenta. Great. And yes, recently, yes, recently, recently, uh, well, we are getting there. We, they are potentially in the brain. We know it's from animals. Huh? They are finding microplastics um, in animals, right? And I liked this read the other day. Well, microplastics could raise risk of stroke and heart attacks. A study says well, there are some implications that are starting to become a bit more clear. Really? I have a second interest in plastics as well. I may confess, I'm not a toxicologist. I don't work in public health, but I'm a civil engineer. Hydraulic engineer, and every day we have a big flood, we end up seeing images like this. Huh? And if we see uh, caravans moving, sometimes trucks and even trains, uh, I can promise you that anything which is on the on the streets is going to be washed off and may potentially uh, come into into the stream. Hmm? What else do we know? Some some colleagues are researching floods of plastic. They have estimated that the transport capacity of plastic during a flood can be up to 100 times larger than during normal conditions. And if you have a bit of litter on the streets and there's a bit of wind, you see it moving. So what well, imagine during a big flood, right? This is this massive. The implications from flooding perspective. So this is a picture from Germany a couple of years ago, and this is against a bridge. This is clogging with litter. So it's not only plastic, it's litter, it's uh, loose objects. Huh? We call them uh, urban flood. Drifters, uh, drifters that they can get stuck into linear infrastructure, clogging, there's bad water, and then this is increasing, increasing the flooding in certain areas. Yeah. And of course, these things moving, not plastic itself, but if you have a caravan or a truck moving, this can also increase the, the, the debris damage. Yeah. And if you start looking at flats, at pictures of flats, it doesn't matter if, if you are in Africa, in Europe, in North America, Southeast Asia, it doesn't matter, you are going to start seeing even houses transported with the flats. Right? And this is something that especially interests me. Actually, this is just from a couple of weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, and we're working actively on that. <clears throat> Let's look at the river. There are many more of you are interested in the river than in the flats. When we look at rivers, and that pretty much this sketch, which was uh, prepared by uh, Chris Van Slager. You might have come across her work. She's one of the champions in plastic transport. And I really like this. This shot because it gives a very good wide overview of many things that are happening in the river, right? So we have wow, transport in the water column. There are emissions that get uh, intaken into the river. There's a, a section of movement, there's turbulence mixing. There could be also wind, and maybe we'll put, put it here and waves. There's wind load. There are also animals that are taking this and maybe migrating, right? So there are many movements. They start uh, infiltrating to the soil. So there are many things that might be happening. And these are not only 
fluid mechanics processes, but were physical, chemical, biological processes that are affecting the fate of plastic and rivers. The truth is, we have very little clue of what's really happening with plastics once in rivers. Huh? And I like looking at, at macroplastics more uh, because they represent a big, big amount of, of mass yes. that can get transported in the river and eventually degrade into trillions of micro or nanoplastics, depending on how they degrade, which is also not fully clear. We know that they degrade, but we don't have it very, very clear. So when we come to this point, you may ask yourself, why do we still use plastics, right? So if this is so bad or this is not looking so clear, why are we looking at plastics for everything? Because we're completely surrounded by plastics. Um, my opinion is that this is a wicked problem. So if you try to you say, okay, plastics are bad, let's stop using plastics, then we have potentially a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Are you going to build everything in metal, in wood, uh, cotton? Yeah. This would completely change the industrial, the industrial sector as we know it, but also the water use, the eutrophication footprint, ozone depletion. So plastic is bad, yes, but somehow it remains necessary in a way. So it's not going to disappear overnight. That is not a problem that if you do research on plastics tomorrow, in three, four years, there will be nothing to do because it's not going to disappear overnight. And the last question I would like to, to raise before we jump into, into a bit more of business is why why should we do research about plastic transport? Well, if you can do research about plastic toxicology, better do that, in my opinion. But if you cannot, I think public uh, plastic transport is quite useful still. Right? It's not as toxicology, that's probably the biggest part here. But if we do research on plastic transport, we might be able to support monitoring efforts. Right? So some of the research I will show you later, for instance, was hinting, showing that Probably the way we monitor, uh, with a few more coefficients, we could monitor better. Without much more effort, but we could monitor a bit better, right? Make monitoring a bit cheaper, perhaps, which could help us to understand where there's the plastic in the river. Yeah. If we do this sort of research, we can also inform cleanup strategies. Huh? If we start doing more hydrodynamical studies, maybe we can discover places in rivers or in aquatic systems where we can trap the plastic more efficiently. Huh? Tra uh, trapping plastic in rivers currently is highly inefficient. Huh? It's very costly. It's nothing that we do in a in a way that's really sustainable, if I may say, mm -hmm. or uh, to the best of my knowledge. And if we're able to know where all this debris, not only plastic, but debris, is, is being transported in rivers, we might also be able to estimate impacts and mitigate them, mm -hmm. all these damage in buildings that we saw before. Mm -hmm. So how to set up an experiment? If you have decided, if I convince you enough that you should do transport experiments, how do we set up an experiment? May I ask you, is anyone in the in the room doing experiments in laboratory? Plastic experiments in laboratory? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, mixed pro, okay? For those who are doing experiments in the lab, you know that when you come to the lab, the first impression is what do I do now, right? All these channels, all these rooms, all these machines, all this, what do I do now? So when Ariana asked us to do these talks uh, to Marcel and me, she had in mind that what she wanted from this is that we could uh, try to share our experience on how to set up an experiment, how to do field work. So I try to break it into small steps, okay? So I'm going to share my opinion on how you should be tackling laboratory work. So this is my five steps recommendation. And the first step is have a valid research question. So don't get into the lab without knowing what you want to do. Okay, don't go to the lab, oh, I have a flow, my plastic, let's see what happens, right? Try to get clear what do you want to tackle? Uh, because doing experiments are very costly. And in some laboratories, maybe this is paid by faculty or by the university, that's fine, but it's very costly. But the facilities uh, could be used for something else. So have very clear what's your research goal. Good. Once you have very clear what's your research goal, share it with colleagues. Okay, I want to do this. What do you think? And people will say, well, this doesn't make sense. Mm. If they make you doubt, maybe you need to think again. No, no, I want to do this because, this is important because. Yeah. And if you're able to have this conversation with several colleagues, this probably means that you want to do something relevant. Advice, be open to criticism, okay? Sometimes we think we want to do this. 
this is very important, but after discussing it a little bit, you think, oh, well, it's not so clear anymore, right? So be careful. Second step, and this is potentially the second most difficult after the first one, which is understand the physics. Eh? We were talking about plastics in several orders of magnitude in terms of size, which means that we have different levels of physics. No? So physics that are volumetric wise, physics that are area dominated, and physics which are, well, Van der Waals forces, no? particles that get stuck to each other, additional forces. So it's, it's good to have a, a priori idea of what are the physics of the problem. What do you want to replace? Because otherwise, you might not be able to set up a, an effective experiment, or you might may end up modeling the wrong thing. Okay? Step three, find a suitable facility and develop the methods. Okay, so you have a research goal, you have cleared the physics, now you need a, a laboratory installation, so you come to Marcel and say, Marcel, can I use your films? Potentially it will be no, I guess, but but find a suitable, a suitable facility where which suits well the experiment that you want to do. Okay, not every channel is good for everything. And sometimes getting access to the right channel is not easy. Yes, maybe for instance, I, I'm doing or I'm going to do some experiments on urban plastic transport. I don't have the facility, but I managed to have access to Coruña. Uh, they have a wonderful university for urban hydraulics to uh, to uh, infraya action, which is to to share uh, to get access to different laboratories. So yes, you know, seek that. Talk to the people, inform yourself, and try to make it happen. Not. So don't say I have this flow, so I will do this experiment. No, let's let's try to find the best fit for everything. Okay. A small versus large. This is also an important question. You will see that for instance in this laboratory, they have very big flumes as well, right? If you want to operate these very big flumes, this is very difficult. Uh, one single person operating these flows can be very, very tricky, right? Doing one experiment can take days. If you go to a very small channel, you maybe can do 10 experiments per day. Are they good enough? That's why understanding the physics is important because then you can decide, well, this size is fine and I can do more experiments. Let's go for that, okay? Methods, methods suitable to the research question. Mm -hmm. That I think is more or less obvious. Second to last step. Once you have your facility, you're developing your methods, you do some first tests and you look closely at the data, okay? You do some experiments, you don't do all the experiments and then you look at the data, you do two, three, four, five experiments covering a wide range of parameters and you start analyzing a look at the data because this may save you a lot of trouble. Right? It's very easy that you start doing experiments and the physics you have them clear, but the, the setup was not finally tuned. So you need to do quite a bit of finally tuning. Right? You come back from step four to step two, three, four, several times until everything is fine. And once you're happy with that, well, this is when you already do your experiments, right? You sample a lot of data, you will find out um, the final data analysis, and you write your paper, your dissertation, or your project report, okay? Let's see how this applies to a, to a project I know well, because I've, I've, been, I've been taking care of that. Mm -hmm. So this example, of these examples I'm going to show you, um, I was very lucky to have the support of uh, Biruk, Biruk Shegoyirga, who was a student of mine in the lab, and he was a champion in the lab. <coughs> and we used the laboratory from TU Delft, from Delft University of Technology, and I may confess Biruk moves in the lab better than me. I went to the lab to show him the things, and then the next day when I came back, the guy was moving much better than me. So he, he was a, a true, uh, a true experimentant. He's now doing a PhD, actually, in experimental hydraulics. So these, these tests were, do, were done a couple of years ago. And these were my first tests in plastics. When I started doing this, I had to be very careful because I was not sure how this is gonna work. So I tried to be as careful as possible. And of course, I received quite some help from, from wonderful collaborators. So we'll talk mainly from, about this first, first investigation. And we did some additional tests, and I will tell you at the end about these additional investigations, okay? So the first, <coughs> The first research item is about suspended and surface plastics. And the second one talks about wet load huh? and some specific mechanisms that may affect the transport. When I started doing research, we didn't have this figure, but it was something similar. I asked myself, what might be important here? 
And I found myself more compelled right, for step one, choose a research question and the research goal. I felt more compelled about digital transport. Right? If we think of what are the mechanics that might be defining how far plastic travels, right? The biggest extent of traveling. I thought that this could be well. Suspended and surface transport potentially, uh, and to a lesser degree, bed load transport, uh, depending on the density of the, of the plastics. Okay, step one, I choose my research goal. Step two, understand the physics. Uh? So if you have studied fluid mechanics, you may have seen this equation. This is just a mass balance uh, in a differential form, which is the affection diffusion equation. We have the rate of concentration changing over time, the advection, which is the velocity times the concentration, how this is transported, has to equal the turbulent dispersion. So if we have a lot of plastics here, less plastics in here, and less turbulence, they will try to flatten this concentration. And then finally, you can have reactive and source terms. So if there's new plastic coming into the flow or into the system, there's a source of plastic or a sink. And if this is transforming, there's a reactive term. Okay, these are the physics. Uh, is there anything else I could be looking at? Well, luckily, and this is a classic problem in fluid mechanics or in paper mechanics. Well, this can be simplified. So if our sources are zero, there's no reaction, it's a steady problem. And we have a uniform flow, so the gradient in the x direction is not because it's everything in regardless of the cross section. We can easily come to this equation, which is much simpler, much easier to understand. Yeah. And what we have is that the rate at which plastics settle has to be in equilibrium with the rate at which turbulence brings them up in the water column. Okay, okay, we are understanding the physics a little bit. Do huh? so we have a plastic particle in a way? Uh, yeah. What we have is that buoyancy has to be in equilibrium with turbulent dispersion. Okay, that's easy to understand, right? This is what we might be looking at in the films. What else is this equation telling us? Well, it's a simple linear differential equation. When we know the concentration at one point, we can estimate which is the gradient of the concentration because we know the concentration at one point, the certain velocity of these particles, turbulent diffusion, which is something we may know. That's from my perspective. We're not going to get there too much today, but this is something that we get for something now. Well, if we know the concentration at one point, the certain velocity is zero. This means that the gradient of concentration is zero, so this is uniformly mixed. Okay, particles that don't settle, we would expect them to be completely uniformly mixed, right? Let's look a little bit more into the physics. What happens if the particles can't settle? Well, if the particles can't settle, they will tend to settle, obviously. So the higher is the settling velocity, the steeper is the gradient, huh? and the concentration profiles will tend to look like this, depending on the settling velocity. Huh? With settling velocity equal to zero, we'll come back to uniform distribution, right? Okay, this is step two, which is understanding the physics, and we can go a little bit beyond. Right? invite you to do the same. Whenever you tackle a problem, try to get as much as you can before you do an experiment. So this equation can be analytically integrated. I leave the steps in there. Uh, it's a relatively easy integration, and we can get to two solutions. Now, if we have a turbulent dispersion, which is uniform in the water column, the concentration profile is basically an exponential decay. Okay. Turbulent, dis uh, turbulent diffusion. In the water column, it's something more like a parabola. Right? It's bigger in the middle of the channel and tends to zero in the in the bounds, yeah? the water surface, or in the bed. We can also do this integration. This is what's called the Rose concentration profile for suspended transport. And this is something we know for about 70 years. And we know that it applies very well to sediments. Yeah. Sediments are relatively spherical, ellipsoidal, and this has been proven several times to work fine. A uh, funny story, this has been proved also with microplastics many, many, many years ago because people used to use microplastic as a proxy for sediment in laboratories. So we have seen that as well. Huh? That's, not completely new. That's not completely new, but it's a very good start, a starting point. Huh? The Ross concentration profile, which basically is reproducing analytically what we were seeing before intuitively. Huh? So we know the concentration in a point. Depending on this parameter, which is a Rose number, which is a ratio between the settling velocity and basically the turbulence forcing, we will have different profiles. So if the particles are very heavy, very heavy, things will tend to concentrate in the in the lower side. If, if particles are very light, they will tend to go up. And if they are floating, so less than some water, this completely reverse. Why is this completely reverse? 
because we have assumed a parabolic uh, the diffusivity. So it doesn't matter if this is the free surface or the red or the other way around. So this is symmetric. It's quite a nice coincidence. Yeah. Good. I think we can say that we have a a priori idea of the physics when we're looking at distal transport. I think we can jump into the laboratory experiments, keeping in mind that we are assuming that our particles have a constant settling velocity and that our turbulent diffusivity, well, is parabolic and symmetric. Okay. Let's go to the lab. Step three, find a suitable facility and develop the methods. So when I was in Delft, I was working in IHC Delft, which is a wonderful, wonderful institute, but we didn't have a hydraulics laboratory. So how am I going to do experiments if I don't have a laboratory? I need to find a suitable facility. And in that case, well, we contacted uh, the hydraulic engineering laboratory of Delft University of Technology. We did some arrangements and they allowed us access there when we set up our experiments. We choose a, a flume, not the biggest one, because these were our first experiments, so we want to be in control, but big enough to have an idea that this is, well, physically consistent. And we'll talk about that the scale effects a little bit at the end, okay? So we get into the lab, we choose our flume, we set up an observation window by the end of the flume. This is where we're gonna look at, at our concentration profiles. Then we set up a system of cameras, which uh, in full honesty, uh, they are not scientific professional cameras, they are GoPros. Huh? We also had some budget constraints. Okay. The trick with this is that if you want to synchronize several other cameras, you can imagine that the GoPros are not designed to be synchronized to scientific standards. So we need to we needed to design a system to synchronize them with flash and lights and so on. Which my colleague who helped me with that told me this is a pain done. Next time I pay for the cameras myself. Okay. But it did the trick. Okay. It was a lot of manual processing, but you know, you need to find a suitable method, okay, with what you have and what you need. Uh, these are our press experiments. Honestly, I thought we were gonna see things that we would not be able to explain. So I was very paranoid with measuring and measuring and measuring. We measure velocities in the cross sections, then with different resolutions, at two centimeter spacing, one centimeter spacing. We set up a lot of laboratory tests. This was this was lasting for six months. Analysis of results, and we were convinced about the physics. We said, hey, let's talk. Let's repeat everything from scratch. Let's see if we see it again, okay? So step three, anyway, I went a bit, a few meters beyond, but step three, find a suitable facility and develop the methods. The methods have to be proportional to what you want to look. Huh? If I want to look at concentrations, it would not make sense to set up a system that is so accurate that I can get accelerations particles, right? I would spend too much time on that. However, what I will for sure need is to know in which position are the, are the plastic particles, right? Because I want to measure well, the distribution of the water column. So with several cameras, what we do is do an image processing detection of the particles. We know where the cameras are positioned automatically with these, uh, these markers, which are called arucos, which allow us, we know the position of these markers, so we can reconstruct the position of the cameras. And basically, if we see the same point in different cameras, we correct for, for the refraction of the light in the water. We can triangulate where is the position of each particle, and we can do that with an accuracy between 0 0.3 to 3 millimeters for each particle and every time step when we detect the particle. Yeah. There's quite more uh, processing that I can tell you now. The good thing is that all my codes are online. So if you go to my GitHub, you can take my calls and you can read them perfectly. They are very well organized. Somebody was telling me yesterday, it looks like you have things very clear. Well, no, but it, at the end, yes. Yeah? And they are documented, so you can take the same codes and, and use for the filtering of the velocity, of the data velocity, or everything is transparent, or as transparent as I could make it, please. Yeah? Step three is still, uh, methods. Well, I want to throw plastics. Which plastics do I throw? Anything. That right? doesn't make sense. We need to be a bit consistent, right? So what we try to do is, well, let's look at positively buoyant plastics first, then we will see the ones that are seeking. Okay, first step. Then discussing with colleagues, well, if we have a plastic which is uh, spherical, this is gonna be like a sediment, so this is not so interesting. Okay. I have the feeling that if the object is very three-dimensional, this is going to you know, lead to something strange. Okay, let's have one like that. What if it's broken? In reality, they are broken. Okay, let's have one like that. Plastics are broken. 
What if it's like a fragment, like a 2D thing? Yes, this makes sense. It could be also different. Let's have one like that. Okay. And if it's a smaller, yes, as well. It might be different, right? This there's a size thing. We know about scale effects. If the size makes a difference, then maybe we'll have a scale effect. Okay, let's see. If it's a form level, I was very convinced that this was never gonna be shaped like the other ones because they wrap up, they reduce in size. So I was expecting something very strange. And again, two sizes in case we could hint on scale effects. And then of course we were on COVID, so we put face masks because everybody was doing that, okay? So maybe it's not the most interesting sample. This was floating a lot, so it doesn't really help too much, to be honest. So great, we have step three set up. The next one is fast data exploration. Right? We go to the lab, we know what we need to have, but we don't know if we have it. So we start doing experiments, we start measuring velocities. <coughs> We start trying to track plastics and we detect a lot of problems that actually we were very lucky to detect. It probably took us two months to finally tune. So for instance, I'm gonna give you a few examples. The first thing we realized is that if we put the cameras to optimize the angles for 3D reconstruction, this is a mess. Because we have reflections of the plastics in the pre-surface when we're low. Huh? So this is confusing our detection algorithm. So maybe we don't need to optimize the 3D reconstruction, but optimize the detection itself and then we'll see. Okay. The background was not homogeneous enough, uh, this type of things, right? Uh, if the background is not very homogeneous, you try to do automatic uh, detection, then you start detecting things that you don't want to detect. It becomes very painful. It becomes very painful. Okay. To give you an idea of the scale, we, we threw 3,500 plastics in this first investigation. So you don't want to track them by hand eventually. If something goes wrong, you don't want to end up clicking points, right? Hydrodynamics, we knew that uh, we needed a shear velocity, which is what you saw in, in this host profile, is a U star, which explains the turbulence in the water column. So let's let's look at that and let's see if the structure of turbulence within the water column is as it should. Okay, we have a logarithmic velocity profile, that's good news. The turbulence decay is also as it should. When we get the shear velocities from different methods, they are matching to a 20%, 15%, 10%, depending. So, okay, when we get these parameters with different resolutions, they are matching more or less, okay. Okay, we are fine. We, for instance, realized that our turbulence was not big enough to really see anything interesting. So we needed to modify the flow and put some sediment plates, increase the rock lens, okay. If we didn't do that at this stage, it would have been a disaster. Probably we would have never seen anything interesting in the, in the experiments, okay. And finally, we get an idea of how much it takes to do an experiment. How much does it take to do a good experiment? In that case, 30 to 40 minutes of throwing plastics. Yeah? We put a plastic in the water, we clean it from bubbles, we shake it, we bring it to a certain position with a distance meter, uh, which is marked in the, in the grabber, and we release it. We take the nice plastic, we do, we clean it from bubbles, we shake it a little bit, we release it. This is nice, but if it's 3,500 plastics, so it takes time, okay? So, well, you get an idea of how much does it take, 30, 40 minutes, plus the setup of the cameras, plus the emptying of the, you know, of the, of the trapping downstream, etc. So it, you get a good idea of how much time you will need. You will know how much time you have available. So you can now decide an experimental matrix that covers the space of parameters that, that you want. Right? Uh, this is what I was just telling you before. Right? This shared velocity is U star, which is a key parameter. So you want to obtain it as good as, as possible. Do not conclude something wrong because you didn't answer it well. And as I told you before, we did this for six months. We got to some conclusions and then we said, okay, we look. Let's repeat all the experiments again. So let's do it. Okay. So we were lucky in that case. And he spent three months again repeating all the experiments from zero. I think they even changed the water of the channel. I'm not sure about that, but I think this was the case. Well, okay, the plastics, we parameterized them perfectly to not have uncertainties, the density from pycnometers, yeah, okay. And we repeated the experiments, and we saw again the similar, the similar behavior, similar physics, so, okay, that's how we, how we got the feeling that we were on good track. Okay. I'm gonna give you an example of, of the results. These are final results. They are all the videos in YouTube. So all the raw videos are in a repository that I, this is, I don't know how many terabytes, to one terabyte, I think, all the videos. But the process videos, so you get an idea of what we are presenting on the results, they are all in YouTube with the code names of the experiments. So you can go and say, okay, maybe this was not detected properly. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Come to the come to the videos, and you can see how they were detected. Okay. 
So we detect the plastic, we obtain the center of mass, and this is what we use to, 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 to show profiles of concentration, eh? Where is, which is the probability density function of the center of mass. Okay? So I think you may start seeing huh, plastics uh, when they go very close to the free surface, well, the center of mass still not be below. The center of mass will never fully touch the free surface, except when it's completely trapped there. And seeing it for the bed, plastics can deform, and we still reconstruct based on, on this projection. Right? And then these are the markers that I was, when I was telling you before. This allows us to reconstruct the position of the camera. This, this type of things come from libraries like OpenCV. I don't know if you have worked with OpenCV, Open Computer Vision. So you can install it. This is the standard in computer vision. And maybe not, not this exactly, but the detection. This afternoon in the laboratory, I will show you a quick code that you can get in five minutes, you see. OK? For the detection. Not the 3D reconstruction, but the, the detection. I will show you. I will show you an example done by ChatGPT, And I will show you my example. Huh? And the difference in times is probably two weeks. One is in five minutes and the other takes two more weeks, but the results are, okay, it's a good starting point. Huh? Or it's that cover flow, I'm sure there's also examples, and I'm sure in the documentation of OpenCV as well. Yeah. This is the same, but for we need plastics. And you get the idea, right? A key thing here, for instance, is the plastics are blue. And this seems trivial, but this made our life extremely easy. Extremely easy, yeah? The other experiments we did, the plastics were ready. And the detection of these plastics, we spent two additional months setting up a new code, which, which OK, it's a, it's a miracle. Yeah? Validating that code was very, very, very hard. All right, everyone, let's jump into the results. So we do our, our full uh, data position. We reanalyze everything from scratch again. So in that case, Viru had done a first analysis and would conclude something. So then I did all the analysis from zero again. Let's repeat and see if we get the same. And then when we start looking at the concentration profiles, we, we get something like this, okay? This is the bed of the channel. This is the free surface. And I will explain a bit more in detail. Obviously, the, the plastics are floating, that tend to float. So what we expect is profiles like this. That's very good. The yellow points are the golden points are the solution of the uh, of the rose profile. So there's no calibration or anything. It's just physical parameters. We take a concentration value, and they are reproducing properly the shape. Huh? This is a bit um, tanky if you want. Of course, it's the data resolution. We have 100 to 150 samples per experiment. If we have 12,000 samples, this would be much smoother and closer to the theory. But we have an experimental uncertainty. Good. What do we see? Well, that these profiles, the rose profiles for suspended transport, are reproducing very well our data, just with physical parameters, up to a certain level. And here is not so obvious, but I include it as well. In this way, it's more obvious, where suddenly we have an over-concentration close to the free surface. Good. What do you think is happening here? Any hints? What you see coloring red are the plastics that are touching, that we detect that they are touching the free surface. Okay. And what you see as a red line, the two red lines are different methods uh, to estimate uh, which is the maximum distance between uh, plastics touching the free surface and, and, and beneath. Huh? And we start seeing very consistently that the plastics in the red area this, uh, this, this uh, plastics are over-concentrated or beyond what a Roche profile would explain. What we discover is that there is a region very close to the free surface, which is more or less of the size of the plastic that you are studying. So the plastic size, when the plastic is closer to the plastic size to the free surface, it can touch the free surface, and the balance of forces around the particle change. You don't only have turbulence, and gravitational forces immerse in the immerse way, but there are other things happening there. I will not get too much into that, but these are the statistical tests, these are called of smear, no? And what this is allowing is, us to do is to compare a true rose profile versus what we are measuring as we go up in the water column. So when we're close to the to the lower level, our our concentrations are statistically uh, similar to the rose profile, and at some point 
when we get close to the free surface, we can conclude that they are statistically different. Actually, this is the only thing we can conclude. Not that they are rose profile, but that they are not a rose profile. And consistently, for 70 or 80% of our experiments, we can see that at some point, this starts differing from a rose profile. And this is the red line that you were seeing here, right? The, the KDS from our of smear roof test. And you can see that this is very consistent with the plastics that are touching or not the free surface. So with that in mind, we'll go back to the lab. And we're going to have a see that we have two modes of transport. Things that are suspended and things that are also touching the free surface. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you a video that will illustrate, illustrate this a bit better. So what happens here, our car wants to go up, the world is still missing it, but eventually it wants to go up. These are our roughness plates. And you won't see in a minute that this, this dancing in the water column, suddenly after it touches the surface, surface, stops dancing. And it will take a very strong eddy to detach it again from the free surface. The consequence of this is that plastics travel for a longer time touching the free surface. They can get detached again, but if they spend more time in there, there will be an overconcentration. concentration Let's look at it again. You can see that the movement is much more erratic. Well, within the water column, within the middle of the water column. And once it touches the yeah, you know, people going then. This is me, and the other one is Bilok. Okay. And Bilok deserves an award because he has a lot of patience. And this is the observation window where we finally you know, study our concentrations. So now I would suggest, guys, let's go back to step two, revisit the physics. Was it the step two? Anyway, let's revisit the physics, right? So when we look at the plastics in the, that are touching the free surface, we don't only have the water forcing, the, which could be drag or even leaf, eh? but we also have, of course, the immersed weight, eh? so the weight minus the buoyancy, and when there's a line of contact between plastic, air, and water, then there can be surface tension. Really? Plastics tend to be, to be hydrophobic. That's something I didn't know before. There's some special coatings. The contact angle is such that the resultant component for most of the plastic, depends on the material and the coating, tends to be upward. Huh? So when you look at all these forces, we revisit the physics again, and I may confess we did it only after we saw the results. Um, you can come to something which is equivalent to a Weber number. This is set up for plastics, but it's a Weber number. If you have worked with bubbles or other multi flows, a Weber number is quite well known. Right? There can be a bond, a Morton, a Weber number. This expresses the ratio of forces between, in this case, turbulence and surface tension. Okay? If this is very big, surface tension is very important. If this is very small, surface tension is negligible. Good? Not convinced enough because we come to this conclusion after doing the experiments. Yeah? I, I had some collaborators who are very paranoid, and this is good for the research. So we started, we continued asking ourselves, is this correct? Is this correct? So we evaluated the forces. Oh, we take a plastic cup, we merge it to different submergence levels, and we can evaluate. Well, the weight is easy, the, the buoyancy is easy, turbulence, we don't know it, so let's make it zero for now. But we can also estimate which is the surface tension force, which is this sky blue color here. And depending on the submergence, depending on contact angles, which are, uh, which are very common for PP, you can find online. You can see that for different contact angles, these forces, uh, the blue force, can be 10, 15% of the total balance of forces. So it might be significant and it may justif justify an concentration, all right? Let's assume that instead of Instead of a surface tension, we also have bubbles. I told you before that we repeated our experiments and we were very careful to remove all the bubbles. Huh? We had this question when we repeated the experiments, maybe they are bubbles. Well, we measured the size of the bubbles, the distribution of size of the bubbles as well attached to the plastic, and you usually have one, two or three bubbles of one millimeter. And we try to remove them. Imagine that we don't remove them. Well, for this sample, even with 25 bubbles, 
the buoyancy and by the bottles is not so big and for one millimeter bottles. Okay, this is not looking too bad. And so on and so on and so on. Okay. So it's most likely, or we can conclude that it doesn't look like it's bottles. Uh, luckily for me, one of my collaborators kept on being very paranoid and said, well, but what if, what if, what if, what if there's air in the ring of the cup? And maybe we're not considering that. So my colleague, my paranoid colleague is Antonio Moreno Rodenas, who is a, an, a wonderful uh, top experimentalist in Deltares. Actually, he developed the 3D tracking. Yeah. So he's, he's key on his research. So yeah, let's do some kitchen experiment. So he took this, this plastic cup in his, in his kitchen. He cut the ring to make sure that there's no, no air trapped anywhere that you cannot see it. And you can see that it stays in the surface. And you will tell me, yes, of course. If you are looking at buoyant plastics, it will stay on the surface, right? That's no mystery. Well, what you don't know yet is that this is not a buoyant plastic. This is a heavy plastic. This is a sinking plastic. So as soon as it stops touching the surface, falls down and settles. And the same for the other piece. And you can see that there's some resistance to sink. Right? What do you think? Are we convinced enough about what's the cause of the power concentrations in the surface? So even the most careful experimentalists after such an evidence, I think, would conclude uh, this is happening. I may confess, when this got accepted for publication, I was in Athens, in the IHR European Conference. I was having a coffee with a fluid mechanics professor. I said, oh, I got this paper accepted. And he told me, what is this about? So, well, surface tension. I said, of course, this is obvious. And then you don't have PAV. Yeah, okay. But, you know, it takes quite a process to convince yourself, and you need to be careful. Of course, and you can still make a mistake, and that's fine. Yeah? Maybe somebody comes in five years and says, well, no, it's not a surface. I don't know. It's interstitial forces, electrical charges, and okay, could be. Yeah? So don't fall in love with your research. Okay? Let me summarize this quickly. So we have... The Rose number, uh, buoyancy versus turbulence, the inverse Weber number, surface tension versus turbulence, and both of them can keep the plastics afloat in different ways, right? We do all experiments and we parameterize the relative importance of each of them. And we can parameterize which is the rate of concentration between what you see up and down. I was telling you before, this is important for monitoring. Why? If you can go to a bridge and count plastics from the three surface, and you know how many plastics are below, then you don't need to go always down. There's still some uncertainty, but it's going to be much better than if you only consider what you are seeing in the surface, okay? I will quickly, quickly, quickly touch upon the second investigation if we have time. It's going to be three more slides. We did something similar, but with sinking plastics. So in this case, we had the feeling that uh, the formal plastics were not making a very big difference. We stick to obligate plastics uh, or not make a difference up to our experimental uncertainty, which is about 10, 15% of the maximum concentration. And we try to repeat the experiments. And this is the type of trajectories that we're getting in these observation windows. And what we observe first is that if you have worked with sediments, there's a bed load layer close to the, to the bed because the plastics are hitting there. Huh? So then there are a bit of different physics. In sediments, this is a small layer, about one to two times the particle size. The first thing we realize is that, okay, one to two times the particle size in plastics can be quite a big part of the water column, right? So it can become more relevant than in sediments. Something that we observe is that many of these plastics that are bouncing against the sediment bed but get deflected, end up in the free surface, touch the free surface, and again, we have an overaccumulation. So these are sinking plastics that are bouncing. They bounce in a certain way, and they can touch the free surface, not because of turbulence, but the bouncing and stay there for a while until they eventually get released. Huh? And something else we observe, and when doing our settling experiments, we did 100 settling experiments for each particle. And something we observe, you are gonna see the same particle falling in two different ways, huh? in a stable situation. So in this case, minimum area, minimum area means uh, less drag, if they have the same hydrodynamics. So this goes a bit faster. And this is more stable, maximum area exposed to the flow, so it goes a bit slower if they were equally hydrodynamic. Okay? I'm going to briefly touch on that just for a minute. What does this mean? We, we de derive the Ross profile for constant settling velocity. What we discover is that we have different 
setting in velocities that can persist for a long time during the transport. Well, this, this requires some flow, not in turbulence. And, and the ratio between these settling velocities can be one to three for, for some of the plastics that we studied, which means that the settling can be completely or massively different. Yeah? Uh, this is consistent with, with what we see in transport with turbulence, which requires uh, just a still water tensor, but we are not able to disclose, uh, well, how this really happens in turbulent transport. So we are still there. Huh? We have the idea that this can be impacting uh, how plastics travel in bed load or, or in the, on the suspended layer, but we are not able to fully. We would need to design an experiment on purpose for that. I have two or three more slides. What I want to show you is that uh, if you work with numerical models, you are quickly reminded that this is not reality, right? Always, yeah, okay, this is a model. This is a model, right? Well, when you work with physical models, they are also a model, and we sometimes forget that. Good. Uh, some people said, yeah. well, the, the famous uh, British statistician uh, Box said all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, this is a classic, but it's true. This also applies to physical models. And we have many limitations in a physical model. Well, from the instrumentation and data analysis, yeah, there's a limit to what you can see. Yeah? If your cameras are not able to detect them, you're screwed. But another example, we cannot conclude, for instance, on the orientations in turbulent transfer because our detection of the main axis of the plastics were not very robust, so we stopped there. Okay, there's a limit to what you can see. Huh? You cannot conclude more than what you can see. And then we have model effects. Huh? We are simplifying in my experiments the river as a 1D flow. In reality, in a river, you may have many other processes, but river binds, uh, you will have centripetal forces in the meanders. So, okay, every, every model is a simplification. And then importantly, the scale effects as well. Huh? You can go with small, but how small is too small? Well, when flow stops being turbulent, when there are difference in the turbulent response. And a very beautiful example, for instance, is the drag of a sphere. If you throw a sphere, this settles with certain velocity, which can be explained by a drag coefficient. Huh? We know very well for this type of, of, of phenomena that you need a certain Reynolds number after which things are relatively stable. Let's say if you do your experiments with Reynolds number 1,000 and with Reynolds number 10,000, which is a factor of 10 difference, you would get the same drag coefficient, right? If you do your experiments with 10,000 or with 100, then the difference between the drag coefficient is going to be two, three, four, five times one the other, right? These are scale effects in simplified ways, okay? In simplified terms. If you're interested in that, I, I, I cannot but recommend you to read the papers from Valentin Heller, which is a classic and a milestone, which is a scale effects in physical hydraulic engineering models. And I think it's even open access. So I think I read it when I started my PhD, and I think everybody who's doing experiments should, should have it. Good. Let's quickly conclude. So what do I want to tell you with this nearly one hour long talk? That doing plastic transport experiments can be useful yeah. to inform policy to improve methods of detection in rivers, to you know understand better design model. Um, when designing an experiment, don't just run into the channel and do whatever you comes to mind, but think carefully, right? because that's an expensive thing to do, even if it's only your time. So try to follow the five-step process or something similar. Have a clear research goal. You know, you can adapt it a little bit if you are, but have a clear research goal. Then once you are there, you can adapt it, but don't go all over the place. There are people who want to do everything. Huh? So just do one thing and do it well. That's my, my recommendation. Don't ignore the physics or fluid mechanics. When we talk about physics in plastics, this is multi-physics. There are many other things. Imagine you have Van der Waals forces, then it's going to be a completely different scaling of everything, right? Cross verify the data as early as possible to avoid a major catastrophe. Yeah? Don't spend four years of your PhD getting data and in the last month analyze data because you are going to cry. Eh? You're going to cry like a river. And be open to criticism. Eh? And maybe this is the most important thing. If everything goes well and you publish your paper, and receive a paper, I still do not fall in love with your research. Okay? If you have done very good research, the best thing that can happen to you is that in five years somebody comes and does something better. Okay? And that maybe 80% of the conclusion are similar, so are different, but this is good. This is healthy. If things aren't changed in the future, this would mean that the research uh, community is dead, right? So the best thing that can happen to you is that in two, three, four, five years, somebody comes and does better research, okay? So be open to, to criticism. 
And that's all. Thank you very much for joining.